It's November 7th, 2019, and this is episode 15 of Plane Savers. <laughs> Down under. And today we're at the Caboolture War Plane and Flight Heritage Museum, just up the road from the Beaufort Restoration Group and next to Tavis. So we'll take you through the museum and we'll give you a look at another small volunteer museum. This one's been going for quite a while, been around for a long time. Okay, so here we are in the entrance to the museum and one of the added benefits of this museum is if you want to fly in a Mustang, here's the place to do it. There's the prices, different times, right? So if you want to fly in a genuine warbird, this is the museum to come to. The Mustang's not here at the moment. It's down at RAF Base Edinburgh for a big air show, but should be back next week. Unfortunately, I'll miss it to get in this out for you. But this is the entrance to the museum and we'll wander out here. Now, here's our North American SNJ Texan. Or Harvard as it's called by the Brits. And over here we have the nose of a C-47. And we'll wander over here and have a look. We've got some different canopies. That looks like it might be a mosquito. Let me double check. It is a mosquito, a photo reconnaissance version canopy. You can tell that the age by the metal bracing that's not in current So we go and have a look and see the inside structure underneath there for the canopy. And here's a more modern one. It's still an old aircraft. It's out of the Canberra. And you can tell that by the, the particularly big dome that this type of canopy has out of, the, out of the Canberra. It's nowhere near as braced as what the Mosey one is. And we have a Blackburn Cirrus Miner. And I think we might know what that is. Merlin, and we definitely know a double man, but we've heard and seen those before. So there's a whole range of engines, again, from the centrifugal engines out of the Meteor and Vampire and Venom, or the Goblin. Um, there you are, Ghost. And here we are, a Link Trainer. This time we can actually have a, a little bit closer look at it, because the previous ones we've looked at have been up a bit higher. But you remember the canopy would go over the top here. Here would be all your controls. And this is your early simulators. So you'd be able to fly in here with all your basic instruments. You see the radio number of that? Oh, A13-1, the very first one. Yes. There you go, the very first link trainer for the RAAF. That is really an historical piece. And now, right, here we are, the escape capsule from an F-111. Now, we've already talked about how that worked when we showed you the example pre in a previous episode. But this one being a little bit closer, we can get in and have a real good look at the instrumentation, the cockpit. And this is the C model, you know, it's just got the longer wings and the heavier undercarriage of the Australian model, which was our own model of the F-111. So that's a good chance to see what a dual supersonic fighter bomber looks like. Where we use them in the strike role, I know they're called F, but in reality this was a strike bomber. Incredibly long range, incredibly fast. And when you blew out of this one, the whole canopy, well, the whole cockpit and some of the superstructure came with you. There's the ordnance you could use. Okay, and there's a, there's a good load 
Now, if you really want to get upset with a, or a neighbour upset you, get hold of one of these and just bring this to him and show him what you can do to them. There's a gun built down there from him, F-111. Now, he is a good old faithful from everyone. The old Huey, the UH-1H Huey. Number 484. UH-1D. Oh, this is a D idol, is it? Not a H. That's right. Okay. There you are. Takes an expert to know, and I don't, I don't pretend to be an expert, but this is the, was the standard utility helicopter for an, oh, probably the last 20, 30 years around, from the start of around the Vietnam War, right up until basically the Black Hawk took over. At least in American, Australian and other forces, where a lot of the... Um, European forces might have run with aerospatial helicopters. The utility helicopter, the Huey, was very much the go-to machine. We'll come around here. And Kevin's opened up the nose for us. There we are. There's the electronics for you. It's got the battery. The last... There the last we are. Crew. The last crew. There you go. Captain Pat Bridges, squadron leader... Cam Morris, Corporal John Nian, Mr. Paul Smith, and LAC Lee Cameron. There we are, the last one. 171 Squadron, that's an Army Squadron. And there we go, it's got everything in here, she's ready to go. We could take her outside and fire her up now. Cassa might get a little upset with us, but uh, who worries about Cassa? Everyone, I think, just like you guys overseas worry about EASA and CAA and FAA and all the other rest of the alphabet suit that happens to be around. And that's how I went to war. Okay, so you're a Vietnam vet, are you? Army, yeah, yeah. Navy or Air Force? Army. Army, okay. My number. Ren gun carrier, Second World War. There we are. That's what a 50, 50 cal. There you go. Last gun of a B 24 Liberator. Okay then. The crash in North Queensland. Oh, look at that prop. Isn't that beautiful workmanship? Look at that. Oh, yes. Isn't that magic? Look at the lineup of props we have over here. I think that was from a Vickers Vimy, actually. Oh, okay then. There you go. Look at the workmanship in that. The beautiful and up the top there, the skids, the laminated skis that are up there, then the wooden props underneath. Aren't they magnificent? Sydney the workmanship. Ah, oh, Sid Marshall used to run an operation at Bankstown in Sydney called Marshall Airways. He managed to scrounge up a lot of World War II aircraft, both Australian and um, our um, foes aircraft, like the 109. A shame most of them ended up vanishing overseas. That one was pulled apart, went to UK as scrap aluminium. Yeah, that, that was how they got caught in the end. I think it was a Spitfire going, wasn't it? Or they got yep. caught on? Yeah, they were classifying them as aluminium scrap rather than aircraft. Single prop out of mosquito. Mm -hmm. There we are. So, but I love the, the woodwork on, you know, the craftsmanship. And there you are, you've even got a, a dummy camel on the wall with a camel prop on the top. See, like most of the museums... Hanging from the ceiling, from the ceiling yep. is a hurricane. Yeah, hurricane up there, then we've got a, a Corsair over there. Um, what well, that looks like a Junkers, I think. Is that all Junkers? I think that might be a Junkers. Then we've got a Tiger Moth over here. The V1 um, flying bomb. That's a Jungman. Sorry, what was that, Kevin? That's a Jungman. No, a Jungman, that's right. I knew it started with a J. A Jungman, Tiger Moth. There we are, a Bristol fighter. And up there, 
Son of Boy. Yeah, we've got the F1. Uh, that's a sonar boy. Yep. And here we are, the little tail of monoplane here, a little outright one of really early ones. Just a little bit of fun, someone probably knocked it up in their backyard. You could buy that as a kit plane in the 50s in England. <laughs> and they cruise about 70 to 80 mile an hour. There you go. And all you need is an old second hand V dub and you could be flying. Yep. V12 Packard Merlin. Uh -huh. Oh, this is a Packard Merlin instead of the Rolls Royce Merlin. Yep. The was... Mustang's got the Rolls Royce in it at the moment. Hmm. That's the Packard. Okay. There's the body plate there. Okay. There's the body plate the Packard. It's got 208 or 218 hours on it. Oh, okay then. Due to, go, due to go back to vintage V12s. Oh, okay, she's going back for a rebuild as a yeah. spare engine, is it? Yeah. Okay then. That piece of canopy is our only existing genuine mosquito canopy. Oh, okay. All the rest of the aircraft were taken down to Wagger and burnt. Burnt. That was the great shame after the war. All the wooden ones were burnt. All the metal ones were melted down for Keynes. There are Mikey, there's the C-47. Or DC-3, that looks like a Northrop, I think. Is it? There we are. Then obviously the Catalina, down here. And like all museums, they're all volunteers here working. I'm gonna go out now, and if the gentleman would allow me to see the piece to the resistance, the Mustang mightn't be here, but here, is a very famous aircraft. Very old aircraft, a gypsy moth. It flew again in September or April 14th again. But this aircraft was piloted by Captain C. K. Scott. And if you look at your history books, he's the pilot of Grosvenor House, the DH Comet, DH-88 Comet that won the McRobinson a London to Sydney air race. So he flew this aircraft initially and he backed it up with a win flying the Comet. So this in itself is a very historical aircraft. Now I'm going to show some of the gentlemen here. They're working real hard, uh, the volunteers and, and that. And uh, I'm going to wander over here and look at this beautiful moth. I've seen it before. I saw it just after it came out of the shed. And I saw it with Ed. Ed Fields, the owner. Ed's a part, he's one of the founders and patrons of the museum. It's a beautifully restored aircraft. It really is a credit to everyone involved with it. Ed, the owner, and the guys who restored it. This is a magnificent machine. Again, look at that beautiful propeller. And the upright engine. undercarriage very very traditional de Havilland undercarriage we have a look at the engine up here at the top unfortunately we don't have smell of vision she's just being fueled and she's just been oiled up I presume she's going flying soon as a dispensation because of the history of this aircraft CASA allowed Ed to retain the British registration on it. You can see that, she's VHUQH, but in order to match the historical nature of the aircraft, there we are, England, Australia, using Wakefield's Castrol motor oil. Okay, a de Havilland Gypsy Moth. There's the Let's have a look at this incredibly detailed cockpit. Usually uh, the passengers in the front. Look at the workmanship in there. And we'll come around here. Now here we are. Again, a very detailed cockpit. 
I'll shorten down my selfie stick so I can get in there a bit better and not blind you, but there we are. There's the statistics on flying the aircraft, stall speed, climb, cruise, compass down here on the right. Now, magnificently restored aircraft. So, there we are. A great little museum with dedicated volunteers like so many of the museums we've seen. If it wasn't for the volunteers, the museums wouldn't survive. Yesterday I showed you the gypsy moth. Well, today she's gonna to go flying. She was fueled up and oiled yesterday, so Ed's gonna take her up. And I'm hoping to be able to get a chance to have a quick chat with Ed about the aircraft, but it depends on just how busy and tied up he is. Yeah, well, ladies and gentlemen, as I said yesterday, this is a magnificent aircraft, and I have the opportunity this morning to talk to one of the true gentlemen of Australian warbird movement and a well-respected aviation, I'll say nut. He's a pilot. He does this, he does that. He restores aeroplanes. Mr. Ed Field. Hi. How you going, Ed? I'm good, thanks. Uh, following on from our discussion yesterday, can you tell us a little bit about the aircraft? Well, this aeroplane is a 1930 the Havilland Gypsy Moth, mm -hmm. and it was built um, for a gentleman by the name of Charles Scott to order, uh, with the intent of uh, making a, a, a run on the Australia, or England to Australia record, mm -hmm. which he, uh, he did, he achieved it. Mm -hmm and uh, arrived in uh, April 1931 in Australia, breaking the time for that distance. So, uh, fairly famous airport. Yeah, and you were saying yesterday, being a forerunner of the uh, Tiger Moth, yeah. um, can you just go through those changes and also its handling characteristics compared to the Moth? All right. Well, what they did, the Royal Air Force were not happy with the difficulty of getting in and out of the front cockpit with a parachute on. So the Havilland redesigned things and they moved the centre section, which is the thing in between the, the two top wings. Yep. They moved that forward to make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, that mucked up the centre of gravity. So they then had to sweep the wings back to bring the centre of gravity back into um, control. And also, with the wings swept back, the wingtip clearance or the aileron tip clearances near the ground mm -hmm. reduced. So they had to put dihedral on the lower wings to um, improve that clearance. So there were quite a few changes. Yep. And of course they put an up an inverted engine in the Tiger Moth, mm -hmm. a Gypsy Major. This is a Gypsy 2, which is an upright engine. Mm -hmm. Same sort of configuration, four-cylinder air-cooled um, engine. And uh, so that Gypsy Major swept wings, a dihedral, became a Tiger Moth. Okay, then. Yeah. And how does it fly compared to a Tiger Moth? Well, I find it a lot softer than the Tiger. Everything's more harmonised than the controls. And I think the reason is that um, with this thing, everything points into wind, all the ribs point into wind, whereas the Tiger with the sweep back, all they did was shorten the rear spar to get the sweep wind. back. So it's all sort of cocked off a bit. So you've got yeah, probably a little bit of disturbed airflow all the time with the Tiger. Mm. And how long did it take to restore this aircraft? Oh, gee, I've, I had the, I've had the project for nearly 40 years. Sounds a bit like the Beaufort down the road here yeah, we're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're probably neck and neck there. But gee, I tell you now, you did a fantastic job on it. Yeah, well, there were quite a few people involved from mm -hmm. the start. A fellow in Melbourne by the name of Charlie Edmonds. He, mm -hmm. he put quite a bit of work into it to start off with. Then we moved it up here and um, you know, Bert... Um, Graham Potts did a lot of work on it and uh, it finished off uh, here at uh, Complete Aircraft Care yeah. and uh, we got a C of aid by Bruce Ramsey who was very helpful and we made various modifications to sort of bring it into the 21st century, century. Yep. Um, and those engineering orders were done by Alan Kerr which was really great. Yep. And um, so we've now got a reliable ignition system, a reliable carburetor. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
it's pretty good. Yep. And you, you, you restored a Wirraway, uh, you've restored the Mustang that flies here, you're a part owner of that. Is there any aircraft that you've also, other aircraft you've restored? Oh, uh, Windjill. Windjill, that's right, yeah. I forgot the Windjill, yeah. yes, that's right. Yeah, we did two Wirraways. Uh, yeah, I remember the one here from the original Warplay War Museum, so I remember that one, and I think that's back here somewhere on the airfield or something, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think it's over in Adelaide at the moment because of the air, the air show. show. That's where the Mustang is at the moment. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Um, I've been acquainted with Ed. I can't say I am a well-known person around. I've been around Ed for a long time, but as I said, he's one of the most respected people in the Australian World Bird Movement, and thanks very much, Ed. I appreciate oh. the time. Yeah, okay. Thanks Pleasure. very much. And if you ever want to have a flight, as I said, the Mustang, come up here and have a flight. And if you're looking at um, restoring a Warbird, complete aircraft care here, do a pretty bloody good job. But uh, we'll just finish off with another look at the engine, this upright engine. Show a little bit definitely you have it. We've seen the Tiger Moth installation. And there we go, a beautiful restoration. And a credit to Ed and all the guys who have worked on this aircraft. They have done a beautiful job. And here's the museum display area. A lot of well-constructed models of all types of aircraft from heavy bombers over there to fighters, more bombers. A well-presented display of models. A little theaterette and a display of headgear from quite old to quite new and a display of uniforms with the RAAF squadron badges and memorabilia and there's something to make you cry all those aircraft lined up were all destroyed at the end of the war out at Oki, which is now the Army's major training base. Again, and a great display of the or models of the construction of a Beaufort. Very well done, very very good layout, this one of, of how to build up a Beaufort. And here we are, the finished example. But a very nice display area and one of my favourites, the Bristol Bowfighter, used by the RWF with great success in the Southwest Pacific and named the Whispering Death by a Japanese for the way it just came out of the air so quiet. And we know that was because of the type of engines that it had, but as we've said, these museums will only exist out of your kindness and your coming to see the work they've done. The nose down there, I've since found out, is very historic. It was from General Waymore's aircraft. General Waymore was the British commander of forces in the Southwest Pacific. 
So that means itself makes it a historic aircraft. And you've got the first ever link trainer for the RAAF. So come and visit these museums. It's usually a very modest entrance fee, but your enthusiasm and your contribution through either donations or entrance fees certainly helps these museums do their work. I hope you've enjoyed your visit to the Caborcha Warplane and Flight Heritage Museum. Until next time.